Before we get started, let me just quickly say one housekeeping uh, thing. Uh, the discussion will be mainly in uh, English and Vietnamese, so you probably want to have your translator ready, translation equipment ready. And also we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions from the audience, so uh, prepare with your questions. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Caixin Debate, uh, the World Economic Forum on ASEAN. Our topic today is digital market, global opportunity. And I can see many of you just put on your cell phone, some still has that in hand. I guess one hour is the longest time we can part with our digital equipment today. And that's not just us. The economies, especially emerging economies, are taking this opportunity to have an edge on the development. And by starting today, I want to share with you two numbers, one and seven. One is this region, ASEAN, is the single most fastest growing digital economy in the world. Every, every month, there will be more than 30 mil, about 4 million people coming online. That's slightly less than having one New Zealand pop up on the internet every 30 days. And the other number, seven, is actually showing us the gap. Uh, the digital economy accounts for only 7% of the GDP of ASEAN countries, compared to probably 16% in China or 35% in the United States. So st there's still a lot of potential to grow. How to close the gap? How to enable businesses, individuals in this region to take the full opportunity and to leapfrog? And we'll have the solutions from our wonderful panelists today and in the next hour. Um, let me quickly introduce our panelists. Uh, sitting on my left side is Minister Tan Tuan An, uh, Minister of Industry and Trade of Vietnam. Hello. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Jerry Matthews, expert vice president of banks in Singapore office, and Toby Edward, and uh, CEO of Shipa Freight. Party Viswanathan, <laughs> uh, chief information officer of Coca Cola Asia Pacific. And also, last but not least, Santi uh, Santirata, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, group chief economist of SRC Group. So let's get started by first question with the minister. So we talk a lot about the potential and we do see that the fourth industrial revolution can have a fundamental change to both the labor force and also to the digital opportunities. But it can be disruptive. Uh, automation can create a lot of the jobs and it also can wipe out a lot of jobs and jobs are important in this region. How do you see uh, Vietnam is tackling this challenge and also taking the opportunity at the same time. Uh, well, uh, good morning and thank you very much for your question from the moderator and thank you for joining us in the discussion uh, on a very important topic for Vietnam's development uh, and also it's a trend uh, in the region's development for Vietnam digital economy. Uh, has already been discussed in the context of Industry 4.0. And of course it will have a lot of implications for Vietnam, not only in terms of economy, uh, but also it has an impact on our immediate future. Uh, and also it has an impact on the development of the country, uh, our economic structure and labor force. Why do I mention labor force uh, in Vietnam? Uh, given uh, the population of 100 million in Vietnam, uh, we see the gaps in the skills of the workforce and also the technology uh, gap. Uh, so uh, addressing the skills of the labor force is a uh, top priority for the government of Vietnam. Uh, we have to catch up with the industry 4.0 and technological advances and digital economy. So the question is how we can make sure that the labor market in Vietnam could be well functioning in the future to ensure overall stability. Uh, but of course, 
Vietnamese businesses, Vietnamese enterprises and employees cannot be left behind in the digital economy and in Industry 4.0. I can give an example uh, to illustrate this point. Uh, in our assessment uh, of Vietnamese businesses in the uh, garment uh, and textile industries, uh, from now until 2020, uh, the industry 4.0 uh, with automation uh, can result in the loss of 86% of the jobs in the uh, garment industry and 40% of jobs in the footwear industry. So footwear and uh, garment industries are very labor intensive and they contribute to GDP growth and trade volume of Vietnam. So. That's one example, but of course we have opportunities and potentials arising out of e-commerce and other industries, including service, agriculture. You know, we can uh, have a lot of opportunities in the service sector uh, in the industry 4.0. So for Vietnam, we need to strike a balance uh, in our strategies for development. We need to come up with strategies and solutions for infrastructure, workforce training, and changing the mindset and raising the awareness of the businesses. I'd like to reiterate that we need to raise the awareness and mindset of the business community because 97% of uh, businesses in Vietnam are small and medium-sized enterprises. So they need to have access to the platforms, new platforms offered by the Industry 4.0 and also digital economy Another example uh, to see the challenge uh, facing the government of Vietnam and Vietnam's economy uh, in our survey recently by the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry, 82% of Vietnamese companies are just um, at the outer uh, space of the industry 4.0. They are not so well prepared for industry 4.0 and only around 10 percent of them uh, are aware of and ready for the industry 4.0. So this is what we need to do to close the gap in mindset and perception. So uh, we uh, look at the uh, adverse or negative impacts uh, on the economy, on the labor market, but at the same time, we also uh, tap into the opportunities offered by the industry 4.0, and we need to have major transformation in our economy. So for the government of Vietnam, there are three priorities. Number one, we need to have the overall strategy uh, to uh, have access to industry 4.0 uh, and digital economy. Second, um, with concrete measures, uh, we uh, raise awareness of the policy makers and then business community and the general public. And third, uh, train our human resources uh, ready for the new platforms and the, the new economy. So in our government's uh, development strategy, we focus very much on infrastructure development, including digital infrastructure and regulatory framework for digital economy and e-commerce. And third, an international cooperation uh, to make use of uh, digital economy. For us, ASEAN is an important hub uh, and also uh, a foundation for us to integrate into the world's economy. So we have the arrangement within ASEAN for cooperation and ASEAN cooperation with other countries uh, in the region. For example, we have ASEF or uh, APEC uh, cooperation or other uh, platforms for international cooperation. So we touch on uh, e-commerce and digital economies in those uh, fora as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's a very comprehensive answer. And let's turn to Gary. And what Minister shared with us is a very uh, thoughtful policy mix. And do you see that in mm. representative in the ASEAN region in, in the whole? And what other trends you uh, spot in this region? Yeah, it's a great question, and uh, yeah, I'd love to build on uh, Minister Tran's um, speech just now. Um, and taking a little bit of example from you, I want to give three numbers out here: uh, 550 and five. Um, the, the Asian digital economy has been growing very fast and very rapidly in the last few years. We're going to have up to half a billion, 500 million users. Uh, active users in the digital economy uh, by the end of this decade. 
In actual fact, uh, Southeast Asia right now leads the trend in terms of active uh, number of hours spent online uh, more than any other country in, in, um, in the world. So if you look at some numbers, we have about 3.6 hours on average versus uh, maybe two in, in the US or Europe. And uh, even in China, uh, the number is, is lower than that. The second number, 50, is 50% 50 of the GDP in Southeast Asia is made by small, medium enterprises. And the growth in digital, in e-commerce, will come from small, medium enterprises. They will drive that growth to come through. And number five represents uh, that five times uh, potential for GDP to grow through digital economy. Today, as you rightly said, Lishin, it's about 7%. Uh, through our report we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago, we predict that that could be up to five times in the next 10 years, if the right investments are made uh, in infrastructure, in education, as you right, very rightly uh, mentioned, but also uh, regulations and policies. So looking at the overall thing, the, the trend is upward uh, for Southeast Asia, uh, probably in some cases the fastest uh, in, in the world, but there are obstacles along the way that have to be dealt, both at a regulatory and government uh, place, but also from, from companies themselves uh, in, in the digital space. Very important. So it's a collaborative effort and also the key word is actually the small and medium enterprises. Exactly. In Collaboration will be key to be able to overcome the challenges. Yeah. And let's talk about another uh, sub, uh, 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 subject that is basically which sectors among them will be the fast in, in, uh, fastest in growing and which are the ones holding the most potential, which will enable them first. And let me turn that to Asante because C Group actually has its uh, business in several different sectors, gaming, uh, uh, e-commerce, and now uh, in payment as well. So which sectors do you think are growing fastest in this region? Thank you, uh, Lishan. I think the way we think about it is it's less about the sector, and it's more about what, which customer segments you want to serve. Mm -hmm. I think for us, one word come to mind is the, to unleash or untap the power of uh, ASEAN youth. Um, and one, one key theme around that, I'll give example of the e-commerce business, Sharpie. We actually did um, a survey with the World Economic Forum of ASEAN Youth, which just launched two days ago. Um, and we actually got respondents, we got asked uh, the youth around the region, 42,000 of them, uh, which is quite a decent sized number. And one thing very interesting that we found is that one in four youth want to become entrepreneurs. And entrepreneur Real spirit runs really high in Vietnam as well, right. which is very promising. But then the question is, how do we help them? And I think that's the key question that we, we battle and we think about every day in Shopee, because Shopee is less about just bring, bringing um, branded goods to consumers. It's not just about empowering right. consumers, but it's also about empowering the youth, the sellers, the micro entrepreneurs, whether you are um, in, in an island far away in Indonesia, you in a rural area of uh, Vietnam or Thailand, you might have some cr local crafts, you might have some uh, new product ideas. We want to be, be able to bring them to the market, connect them to the market, and teach them, educate them, and give them the tools, digital tools, to really expand their market. And so that's really bread and butter. And I think that's the key thing. Um, for gaming, for us, it's um, trying to bring the best games to people who may not have great access to internet, who may not have the highest spec mobile phones. Uh, last year in December, we launched our very first self-developed games called Free Fire. And the, the key strategy there is to develop good games where even if you don't have the highest spec mobile phones, you can still play it wherever you are. So it become a massive hit, not just in the um, ASEAN region, but also in Brazil, which have the same issues. Um, and for the payments, it's really tapping into the unbanked people, which is you know, about 60-70% of uh, population in the region. So different sectors have different angle, but all in the same theme of serving the underserved markets. And it has to be, the solution has to be very localized. Very localized. Yeah. Hyper-localization is a key word. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for sharing uh, this broad and also very specific uh, uh, insights. And let's turn to uh, our two speakers from uh, the industry. Actually, you two represent a very interesting angle from global companies taking the opportunity to be local and also to be very digitalized. Let's start with Sparty. How does Coca-Cola uh, doing, uh, doing its own digitalization in, in, in ASEAN? Right, so first of all, thank you, Lee Sim, for having me here. You know, digital touches every part of Coca-Cola business. They're actually a very physical business, right? We make beverages that millions of people enjoy around the world, and I hope some people in this room enjoy our beverages, right? 
It couldn't get more physical, yet digital is one of our top five strategic priorities for growth. Second thing, you're right, we are an iconic brand, originally from the US, but we consider ourselves a local business wherever we operate. So let me maybe tell a story of how that comes together. You know, our products and our brands reach our consumers through our network of retailers. So we sell through a Tesco or a Big C, we sell through restaurant chains like McDonald's. But the backbone of our business is millions of small mom and pop outlets, right? traditional trade, little eateries, little cafes, little restaurants all over the world, and uh, particularly in ASEAN where a significant part of our business is actually from this trade. Now digital interestingly impacts these outlets. If you look at platforms like GrabFood, GoFood, Lineman, Vietnam, right? Um, for those of you from Singapore, Deliveroo, Food Panda, it really disrupts their business. On one side, these cafes now have access to a huge number of consumers. They're no longer constrained by neighborhood and seating space, right? They can access all the consumers in the city. But on the flip side, it's a challenge. Of course, they have to give up part of their revenue, but interestingly, they now are faced with algorithms and systems, right? They no longer can just be listed. They have to make it to the top of the list, right? And that is not a muscle that many of these small cafe owners have. Now what we try and do is we use our knowledge and our sales force to actually help the restaurant owners curate the menu for online. How do you sell combos online, right? In a way that it grows profitable revenue for them. It helps them. It also helps us, right? Because our products are now available online. So the way I really look at it is it's about a new route to market. Right? But it continues to build on our traditional route to market. So it's strengthening our traditional route to market, but it's also a new route to market via digital. So for me, it's actually about uh, creating shared opportunity, right? which creates a good future for everyone. So it's us and them, and of course the platforms. So that's the way I look at it at Coke. Very interesting, and Toby, you have the experience come from Shipa, right? And which is a very young company building on the uh, leading global uh, logistic company, Agility. You also help a lot of SMEs to getting online, and you have your own story of getting the logistic, which feels like very heavy offline business. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Firstly, let me say thanks to uh, Li Shen and Kei and, and the forum for inviting me onto this distinguished panel. It's, it's, it's great to be here. It's, it's great to be here uh, representing logistics as well. And, and I know, Jerry, you're, you're a supply chain person as well. But uh, during WEF ASEAN, I've heard logistics mentioned a few times. And I'd like to, you know, I want to put it to the forefront because, you know, we, <laughs> we think it's a very, very important, uh, you know, aspect that we all need to think about and we don't talk about it enough. But let me start with a little bit of context about shipper freight. So I've been asked this question. You know, we, we are the digital logistics platform from Agility, which is a global logistics provider. We have a significant business here in ASEAN in, in, in Vietnam, but we had the vision to build uh, this digital logistics platform um, for a number of reasons. First, it would allow us to target these small and medium-sized uh, businesses that want to go global uh, in, a, in, a, in an easy way and an easy way for them to reach us. So it helps Shipper Freight helps Agility reach these customers. It helps us with productivity. It helps us with our cost to serve. But we can also reach a wider group of companies and help them. I've also got some numbers to share with you. We, we recently did a survey of 800 SMEs in eight countries around the world. 94% of those SMEs said they face difficulties when they, sh when they ship internationally. Mm -hmm. I think we all know that. And Mr. Tran, you talked a little bit about this in terms of awareness and understanding. But so other numbers, 86% of logistics costs can be impacted by going digital. So there is a huge opportunity for SMEs to go, firstly to go global, but to use a logistics platform to go global. And we're not the only company doing this, but we think we've got a big opportunity um, to, to, sh to take SMEs global. Um, and again, in that survey that we did, these SMEs want to go global. They want to serve new markets. They want to reach new markets. The SME in Indonesia that has um, jewelry wants to be able to access um, the, the global market. And they have the capability to do that now. And with a platform such as ours, as, ours, as Shipper Freight, we think we can we can help them. And we know they face challenges. They face challenges with documentation, with compliance. And again, we try and digitize that process to make it as easy as possible for these SMEs to get connected. 
Minister Tran mentioned this about companies in, in Vietnam with only, I think, 10% of them really being aware of the Industrial Revolution 4.0. And I think that's a key part. There's a mindset that these SMEs need to embrace as well when they think about going digitally. And, and, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit later on as well. Okay, thanks for sharing. And uh, let's build on top of that. We talk about the company, especially the SMEs, digitalization process of them. It can be daunting, can be new. What's the standard? How do we evaluate how digitalized a company is and what's sufficient? Okay. Great question. Um, actually, I want to start by stating um, some, some basic aspects here that we see in the region. For example, some companies have a lot of desire to enter the digital ecosystem and e-commerce but only 65% of them actually have access to internet mm -hmm. today. So we still have to carry and, and cover some thresholds when it comes to connectivity, uh, when it comes to digital integration. And I think to cover that, there needs to be, uh, there are certain things that uh, companies need to do themselves, a small, medium enterprise, but there are also certain things that governments need to do in terms of providing consistent uh, coverage of Wi-Fi, for example, and internet, and stable, um, managing cybersecurity and other type of threats. The second aspect for, for a company that needs to meet is around the skills. And operating the digital world is as much as meeting the technological thresholds, but also the, having the mindset mm -hmm. to be able to operate. And I love the example you gave, because that, that's exactly the truth, is about having that mindset of what is my new target? What's my new, um, uh, the new KPIs I have to fit and the new metrics? And a lot of these small businesses are not sure how to go about in, in doing that. So there's an element of education. Other areas where um, we see uh, digital companies uh, kind of falling behind a little bit when it comes to regulation and policy. Actually, if you are, um, you may have a great idea, you may have a great product and you have a small uh, company, it's very difficult to navigate the system, understand what, even what type of paperwork you need to do trade, to be able uh, to sell a product that meets all the specification quality criteria. Um, or, or other parts of, of, of consumer protection that you have to go for. And that's even within a domestic market. Imagine trying to go into an international market. So simpler regulations, simpler policies are important. And then the final point I want to I cover, which is very important, is, is around financing and payments. Um, for some of these SMEs to really meet their full potential on growth, they need to go cross-border. And don't need to go very far, even regionally, within um, ASEAN, uh, they need to go cross-border. Uh, cross-border will be able to meet the full potential in uh, new, new products, innovation, and new markets and consumers. But to do that, there needs to be a payment platform, both uh, for their income and the revenue, but also for financing their trade. And right now, globally, we have about $1.5 trillion in a finance gap, uh, main, mainly coming from, um, from Asia and mainly coming from small medium enterprise. That is, small companies that want to trade cross-border, but they can't because they don't meet the financial criteria. And that's where technologies such as distributed ledger technology and blockchain can come in and provide a lot of solutions uh, in closing that gap. Um, and our prediction is that if that was able to, to happen, we could see up to $100 billion of, of extra uh, GDP coming through in this region uh, simply by closing the finance gap in, in the next uh, five years. Very important. Let me, let's come back to uh, the financing and also the infrastructure uh, question slightly later, but I want to touch on the uh, mindset that you mentioned. Actually, it can be daunting. It can be uh, how to educate people that it's not as scary as it sounds to go digital, but you have the, a lot of experience being the techie right. person on the table. And I'm, I'm, I'm the techie on the panel, and I think I'm ready to do a thesis on this. <laughs> I think there is a lot more hype and about digital. It's actually simple, mm. right? If you mm. apply good business sense, it's just a little difficult to navigate if you are not familiar with it. So I actually spend a lot of time within my own organization demystifying this, right? Demystifying how simple it is. And it's actually extremely important that it goes all the way down our chain to our salespeople because it's our salespeople who face the small outlets. It's our marketers who actually face our consumers, right? So there is need, I believe, in really creating that mindset. And also, we really need to stop talking about digital as something separate, right? Digital is really part of our business. At Coca-Cola, we run a beverage business in a digital world. We don't run a digital business, right? We run a beverage business in a digital world. And I think it is actually extremely important to have that understanding go down the chain, right? The second thing is, um, there's a lot of diversity in ASEAN, and I think that's a positive. 
right? So we have countries with uh, low penetration of digital at the moment. I'm sure that's going to change, right? And there are countries like where I come from, Singapore, which is hyper digitalized, right? And for companies like ours, it is the ability to operate <clears throat> in whichever world that we need to operate, right? The world is becoming digital, but as you rightly said, um, you know, it's a certain part of our GDP, right? So I think it is to strike the balance, right? Um, it is to be the way consumers in that country want you to be, right? Um, have the level of sophistication for our small outlet partners, the level where they are ready. So that's the way I look at it, but I have a lot of passion in terms of demystifying. I don't know how you think about it. Um, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, there is definitely a mental barrier. Actually, back to the, the youth uh, survey that we did, um, that we also asked a question about what do the youth in ASEAN think about the impact of technology on jobs in the future yeah. and income. And the result is actually, astonishing, it's actually quite positive. Okay. So people are generally optimistic, but there's a huge variation across country and across education and age. Okay. Um, and so um, countries like uh, Vietnam is actually quite positive. Um, countries uh, uh, like uh, Indonesia and Philippines are also quite positive on the mm. impact. And also there's a variation across age group. Um, the, obviously the younger groups are much more positive and the older groups much more pessimistic. So it may become a, just probably a mindset issue and familiarity. Where if you're born digital, you're so used to these things, it's probably not so new and not so daunting. Right. But if it's something new to you, then you have to get that mental barriers. But I agree with you. It's, it's not useful to draw the line between the digital and real economy. You have to in integrate them and That's think right. about how to use the two of them to serve the underserved market. Absolutely. If I could just make a point on this, uh, you talked about demystifying things. I mean, uh, what I'd love Shipper Freight to do is to demystify logistics. So if, I, if, if you run a quote from Hanoi to Chicago as an example, which, which you can, the system, we build a compliance database into Shipper Freight that will tell a shipper what documents they need to provide. And just on that one trade lane, there may be 10 documents mm -hmm. that need to be provided, everything from certificate of origin to packing list. Now, for an SME who's going global, when they come onto the platform, they see this. They're sort of, oh, I, I, I never dealt with this before. Um, so we're trying to digitize that element, but there's an education. We need to demystify what, it, what is needed. Now, we're working with regulators and governments and customs authorities around the world to try and make that easier. Uh, the ASEAN single window is going to help, but there is still, in, in, in my area in logistics, it's still very complicated to do cross-border. Jerry, you talked about this. And for SMEs, it, you know, it, it, it just creates a huge challenge for them. And we, through digitalization, we're trying to help them overcome that. But even some that go on the system and you put this list of things, we need these, and they say, well, I never, I never got asked for that before, so mm. I, what do I do now? Um, so there's, there's a challenge and an education and a mindset change that we also need to, yeah. to have, as well as the connectivity that we still need to overcome with some of these SMEs. And um, great answers. And also, uh, let me uh, focus slightly more on the e-commerce, because <laughs> many of us touched upon uh, that uh, in our uh, remarks. And also, e-commerce is actually, um, if you count all the unicorns in this region, almost half of them are e-commerce related. Yeah. Why is e-commerce so important and so popular in this region? And what does it uh, uh, change the total landscape in terms of um, providing a better environment or educate people to know more about digitalization or getting people, more people online and use that. Uh, let me start with the minister from uh, the Vietnam case. Well, uh, before we talk about e-commerce, I'd like to come back to uh, the point made by uh, the panelists. Uh, what you said today uh, has to do uh, with the government's uh, job uh, in ASEAN, uh, it's clear uh, that uh, our colleague from Coca-Cola said that you know uh, there are differences in the economies of ASEAN given different levels of development uh, and differences also exist in the infrastructure including digital uh, uh, infrastructure and Edwards uh, works in the uh, logistics industry and I can also see the important role played by the government in uh, raising awareness uh, for a digital economy development and I'd like to give you one example from the point of view of the government of Vietnam 
so that you can see uh, the comprehensive view. The government established uh, the uh, steering committee for e-government chaired by the Prime Minister and ministers are uh, members of the steering committee. And our principle is that uh, in 2018 and 19, we will put in place the e-government services across the board, providing public services uh, with the application of uh, online services. For example, at our ministry, Ministry of Industry and Trade, uh, half of our uh, services are provided online at level three and four. That means we do not require them to have face-to-face -face interaction uh, with our officers to get the services done or offered. So what it means is that if 100% of services offered online, and then we can improve the efficiency of the government, making it easier for uh, people to access the services. And we can also uh, reduce the dependence on uh, cash-based economy, uh, and also put in place the level uh, playing field for enterprises and also facilitate integration within the region and also into the region, uh, economy, uh, international economy. Well, in Vietnam, uh, the uh, communication uh, infrastructure or telecommunication infrastructure uh, is very well developed, covering 90% of our country. Uh, and in 2017, 2018, uh, the number of Internet users have already grown very fast by 20 percent. And uh, today we have around 74, uh, 77 percent of the population have uh, access to Internet. And we try to increase the number of Internet users in Vietnam so that they can have better access to digital economy and make the best use of the, uh, those platforms. And the third point, as I said earlier, what is important is uh, that, you know, the, you know, um, without a joint effort among different countries in ASEAN, it's quite difficult to integrate ourselves and also integrate into uh, the regional and global economies. So we need to have concerted efforts. We, have, we need to have the joint strategies for integration. Uh, ASEAN and uh, um, Northeast Asia uh, are seen as very robust and dynamic uh, regions in uh, in, in the uh, global economy. So we need to strengthen integration uh, and cooperation within ASEAN. And we have ASEP, a treaty which is being negotiated. And by 2019, it could be signed. So we set common standards uh, to put in place the digital infrastructure. Uh, this infrastructure will be standardized, facilitating uh, the flow, uh, the movement of labor, uh, and also provide better access for people uh, to the global economy. So I want to emphasize the role played by the government in this exercise. Now, let's come back to e-commerce. Well, uh, if we make the best use of these existing platforms, e-commerce will be further growing in the future, contributing to global trade and uh, economic development as a whole. In Vietnam, uh, we are seen as one of the most uh, the top 10 potential e-commerce market, uh, e markets uh, in the world. In 2014, um, e-commerce just account 2% of the total uh, trade in Vietnam. And by 2020, it could uh, amount to 5% worth around 10, tr uh, 10 billion US dollars. So if we compare that to ASEAN and the countries, it is very small. So we have room for development. We need to put it in place the ecosystem for startup and also uh, for e-commerce. Uh, and of course, it depends on the level of development and mindset of the business and also the Republic. And we put emphasis on human development, uh, uh, skills development, uh, and it will help us to uh, leverage and catch up uh, with the uh, e-commerce uh, trend in the world and in the region. Thank you. You set out several uh, very important uh, policies are implementing, and it's very encouraging to know that Vietnamese government is taking the role uh, as not just promoting the digitalization, but also using digitalization in its own policy making and uh, transparency. So, out of the all the policies in terms of infrastructure, out of all those, you got a full plate. What will be the single most important thing that is very instrumental and that's most critical in terms of uh, providing digitalization infrastructure? Well, uh, and.
and uh, I'd like to reiterate that the government has an important role to play in putting place in a conducive environment in terms of uh, legal uh, framework for the development of digital economy and e-commerce. But of course it has to be put in the context of the overall development strategy of the country. Uh, and we uh, refer to the case of uh, China, uh, Germany, the United States, or uh, Indonesian uh, president, you know, mentioned that uh, in this uh, forum, uh, the country's strategy for development by 2020. So, uh, you know, we need to look at the reality of each country and tell it to our own circumstances. So we develop our comprehensive strategy in Vietnam, and we put e-commerce into that overall development strategy, and we also need to create a conducive environment for startup and digitalization and e-commerce. Um, we focus on uh, the following elements. Uh, number one, uh, digital infrastructure. Uh, we already have you know, very good uh, foundations. Uh, for example, we already have the e-government or uh, telecommunication infrastructure uh, for example, we have 3G, 4G, and 5G soon to be offered in Vietnam. Uh, we also have regulatory and institutional framework. Uh, of course, we have room for development. Uh, we need to translate laws into actions. Uh, you know, uh, we uh, need to promote uh, IPR, intellectual property, uh, and other rights. Uh, and it, it has to do with the development of digitalization and e-commerce as well. So we try to improve our regulatory framework uh, in response to digitalization and e-commerce uh, uh, in terms of copyrights or intellectual property rights, IPR or uh, uh, security uh, for users, especially for payment purposes online. You know, we try to strengthen our uh, regulatory framework to follow through our international uh, obligations and also uh, to translate international treaties into concrete actions here in Vietnam. Uh, and I very much agree to what uh, Mr. Matios uh, has already said, uh, resources. Uh, we, we need to have, you know, rich uh, the financing gaps uh, so that SMEs you know, can have access and the government needs to put in place resources available. But what is more important is that the policies need to be open enough uh, to uh, help businesses to be engaged in this uh, process. So we are talking about the development-oriented uh, government in Vietnam, action-oriented government in Vietnam. So what it means is that you know, we you know, put uh, uh, transparency first, uh, put in place the conducive and open environment for all actors to take part in the economy, including e-commerce and uh, digital economy. And human resource development is also very high on our agenda. Uh, Vietnam cannot do it without uh, strengthening the role of the private sector. Uh, we need to work with the private sector to develop human resources to make sure that we have the skill sets uh, needed for the industry 4.0 and for the digitalization in the future. I would like to um, add to, to the point because the point um, that Minister Tran said it really resonated with me, especially the point about working together between the public sector and private sector mm -hmm. together. I think that's absolutely crucial to build the capabilities. And just to give you uh, the example of that, um, we have um, Chop University, which is um, an offline uh, workshop program that helps teach sellers to go online. And we work very closely with uh, different governments in ASEAN, uh, especially give you an example of, of Thailand, where we work with the SME Development Bank and SME Promotion Office. The government helped us by screening some of the SMEs so we know that these are legitimate business that have some history. Um, we then help teach them run an camp uh, offline campaign from teaching how to take photos to set up online stores, to something more advanced like using digital inventory sales management tools. And the result has been astonishing. Uh, in Thailand case, uh, one case where we helped one of the organic rice seller and health food products from Nan province, um, the sales went up 80% within just a few months because it went online. They don't need uh, the massive uh, sales force to go from cities to cities to cities so this has been a you know, great success story, and there's so many stories like this that are coming from a collaboration between a
public sector and private sector together. Collaboration definitely is the key. And uh, also the private sector can provide the very important know-how. But also something is very important is the talent pool. Do, we ha do you think we have a talent gap in this region in terms of totally um, making the potential into, uh, into reality? From where I sit, um, ASEAN's always been home to strong talent, right? We've always had a rich pool of talent, and I expect actually it'll only get stronger, right? I think when I look at talent development, I look at it in two ways. There's the long term and there's the immediate term, right, here and now. When I look at the long term, it's about education systems, but I don't really think it's about let's teach coding at schools. It's not literally that, right? Because we don't know what skills are needed 20 years from now. The pace of change in digital is just so fast. I think what is important is to develop in our children, I mean, I'm a mom myself, right? The qualities of curiosity, right? Problem solving, creativity, interpersonal skills, and the ability to deal with change as it comes and kind of be a self-learner. I think that's really what is critical, okay? The other side is the immediate term. This is another area of great passion for me. I've been an IT professional in the industry for 21 years. It takes exactly six months for me to be outdated. Right? It is really irrelevant what I studied in school and in college, or what I even did in my early years at work. It is about the ability for me to keep continuous learning, retraining myself, retraining my skills, right? and for that I need to put aside time. Right? And as a manager, as a leader in the organizations, I believe there's two things we need to do as corporations. We need to give employees time, the single most scarce resource, right? and of course financial support wherever they need it. Um, the information is all available online. There are all kinds of uh, training course classes online. We can learn, but we have to put the time. We have to have the mindset that you have to reskill yourself. I have to. Right, definitely as an IT professional. And at the Coca-Cola company, actually one pillar of my digital strategy is called system education. Right? We focus on helping our own associates learn to do beverage business in a digital world. So I have a lot of passion for this. So I think there's a long term and there's an immediate term. And again, the theme is the same. It's about the private-public partnership. I'd like to add, a, just build a little bit on that point. Um, you're absolutely right. There, there is a gap in talent and skills in, in, in the region. And that gap is driven both from uh, sort of knowing the basics and how even having access to technology, as we said earlier, but also on the fact that digital is moving so fast that people are, are don't, maybe don't have the mindset which again goes back to the point of mindset, being able to say that I need to go and re-educate myself, I need to go and do that. We, we spend a lot of time um, with, with our program called Simple, Simple and Digital, um, and this is something where we work with, with companies to help them bring those mindsets and bring that understanding within their organizations about the implications that digital has on the day-to-day -day job, but also in terms of what's coming ahead. Um, which is uh, equally equally critical. And then just very quickly, I, I want to, I fully agree with you, there is a there's a big responsibility on the education side. Um, many countries are still using legacy education systems where other countries that have already advanced in, in digital, such as Singapore, for example, moving into alternative education systems that are based more on experiences, are based more on problem solving, as you said, and also on um, understanding the curiosity. Um, and I think doing, having that shift at, at the bottom, so that means on the new generation, of the second generation of millennials that's coming through, but also dealing at, at the organization level with programs like Simple and Digital or with existing workforce and bringing that mindset will help close the existing gap that we have on um, digital education and capabilities. If I could just make one point on this as well, the, the, the element of change management that needs to be uh, initiated in, in organizations is, is something that we, we do talk about, but we don't probably think about it enough. And I think back to my own organization. So when we built these new digital processes and workflows and we you know, push them down to the operator level and then say that there's your new process and we, we imagine because it's tech driven that they'll do it but it takes some time for them to get used to it and so productivity can sometimes you know slow in, in the early days before it hopefully ramps back up again but I think you mentioned it as well there's, there's just that element of you build the technology and the digital processes but you still need the change management and you need the people to start using the system exactly. and getting used to it because there's a new way of doing you know mm -hmm. operating for them. Um, so that's, that's a very, uh, something very interesting that we're seeing you know, within our own company now. If you can move from the micro level more to a macro level, the change of habit, the e 
uh, financing, basically financing is actually taking a lot of changing people's mindset. We talk about e-commerce and in Vietnam that the majority of e-commerce, maybe 80% of them is paid cash on delivery. So how to, in terms of uh, SEA group do a lot of, a C group do a lot, uh, does a lot of uh, uh, payment, currently do more, increasingly more payment now. How to change that habit when you move up? Yeah, no, <clears throat> it's a very important question. And I think there's both the supply side the supply frictions as well as the demand side. So the supply side, um, you already mentioned the fact that um, there's very small proportion of uh, population in ASEAN which have full access to bank, they have bank accounts, even smaller who have access to credit cards. And this reflects part of a problem which are sometimes basic but very fundamental. Not having a unique ident identity ID or don't have uh, enough papers just to go through the cumbersome KYC process to set up accounts to low financial literacy. But even for those who have bank accounts, the online payments doesn't come automatically, mm. especially in e-commerce. There's always a trust issue. Yeah. If I transfer money out to you today, let's say you're the seller solution, can I make sure that you can actually send me the products tomorrow um, and it will be the right product in the right conditions? Yeah. So one of the solutions that we, we, we sort of use in Shopee is called uh, Shopee Guarantee. It's basically establishment of escrow account. Mm -hmm. So that uh, funds will go to Crystal escrow account first and only when I receive the product and it's the right one, I'll click confirm and the money will be transferred uh, to, to you. So that helped one layer of the trust issue. But I think that's more on the supply friction side. There's also the demand side of payments, which people don't talk enough about, I think. Remember that payments is a derived demand. We need to do payments because we need to do some transactions, some services. And so if you learn from cases like in China, you need a powerful use case for digital payments mm -hmm. to help drive the adoption. In China, we've seen e-commerce, we've seen social payments, ride hailing being a very powerful use case. Those are being developed in this region, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah. So it's true that um, payments help e-commerce, but also true that e-commerce also link back to payment because it can drive stronger demand for adoptions. Yeah. So it's an integrated whole. And if I may add to that, actually, I love your China example. I, I spent 10 years in China, in Beijing, and I saw the whole change going from when I arrived in China that I used to take piles of cash from the bank to be able to pay my bills and rent and, and everyday things to when I left China last year that I would take cash once out of you know once a month out of the cash machine and even my kids would look at them and go, oh wow, it's <laughs> my money still exists because I thought you all would pay with WeChat. Um, I could pay everything with WeChat, but the power of e-payments has come from having a very credible and basic platform that people have. And that has driven e-commerce behavior, and the key word here is behavior. It's not adoption, it's behavior. Because the adoption is in inevitable once you go into the uh, e-payment system. But the behavior of the consumers uh, going online uh, regularly, frequently, and giving that explosive growth in, in e-commerce has come from the enablement of, of payments, of e-payments. And in many ways, the train has left the station on e-payments. Um, it's not going to come back, and you know, we are moving very, very fast towards cashless society, but there are, there are risks. There are risks around security, there are risks around trust, um, and there are risks around uh, well, with cryptocurrencies and so on that, that are emerging. And these, I think, have to be managed in a dialogue way together with the consumer side, but also the organizations, governments, or other regulatory bodies that have power to, to bring in policies, but the right policies. And also you mentioned behavior. Behavior and more usage, more use cases create data. And how, what's the data flow regarding the uh, digitalization in this region and how to, provide, um, do, how to provide the sensible and the right level of protection of data? Um, if, I, if I look at it from a logistics point of view, I give an example of the um, ASEAN single window, which is set up within ASEAN to exchange documents between the ASEAN members. Now, not all members have, have signed up to the ASEAN single window, and not the members that are in it are not um, supporting all documentation. So I think there are still trust and integrity and reliability, reliability issues around sharing data. Um, across borders. I know many countries in ASEAN are, are, are now looking at new policies about where data sh should be stored. It should be stored in country uh, versus going across borders, which creates challenges. So you have, on the one hand, um, a vision to share data across ASEAN because it would help everybody. Um, but on the other hand, you have 
countries for various reasons, for security, for data integrity, for protection, for user protection, etc., are talking about keeping data in the country. And when I talk to fintechs about building financing on, on ship of freight, they want to ask me about data. What data can you tell me about your customers? Because that's what fintech want, wants to know. If they want to finance somebody, if they want to provide a payment you know, or a credit for this customer, they, the more data I can give them. So I think it's going to be a challenge that, that we face um, across as in, across the world. And uh, I don't have the answer for it yet. I don't, Jerry, whether or not you have a viewpoint on this one. You want my yeah. happy answer? Yeah, so, so data is, is important, and, and I think uh, when, when you think about data localization and, and, and policies around that, um, it's, uh, I think it, it's a bit of putting your head in the sand, right, and, and being able to come out of it and think not just for data for your own country and your market, but how, do you, how can that data localization approach or data issues hinder development? Um, and I, I believe, we believe that uh, based on um, our research and, and that we've done over the years on trade, that data... The issue with data is similar with, with trade. The lower the borders um, and the lower the barriers um, of in, on data sharing, the better will be for the economy uh, to pick up and, and, and grow. So going forward, um, being able to lower those barriers around, around data, sharing data, will be a, a absolutely important. So share da sharing data first. Right, right. Because I think we've gone past the point of so privacy and, and wanting to withhold privacy will always be an issue, but we'll have to find ways how to, how to manage that privacy and governments and companies have to maybe step up on data security and withholding it. But it's almost impossible to have cross-border e-commerce, for example, without sharing data. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's like trying to fly without wings, probably. <laughs> Won't go very far. Indeed. Um, we have probably uh, slightly more than five minutes left, so let's open up for the question of the floor. Um, there's a gentleman on the back. Hi, um, my name is Ken. I come from Singapore, and uh, but I represent people with disabilities across Asia Pacific. And um, I think you know when we talk about inclusive growth, the definition of inclusive differs yes. from time to time, right? Yes. So my job here is to make sure that disability is included in inclusion. And um, talking about the digitalization effort and a specific part of it, which is the O2O market, um, something that you know, I wanted to first highlight and ask a question is that um, specifically for people who are blind, 70% right, of the information that we perceive is visual. Mm -hmm. That's before voice-based UI takes off. Right? And a lot of the, the current digital products that we use are all visual, right? uh, predominantly. So what has happened is that unless we make the online um, versions accessible, the offline means is the only accessible option for someone who's blind for services of daily living, like banking, travel, food and beverage, and stuff like that. Um, and because of the way we balance our resources, you know, there is um, a worry that we have that if we go through that, that digitalization effort without that cognizance, that blind people would lose access to services of daily living. So uh, my question is, how much social conscience can we bake into our product development process and shift left to, con to the conceptualization phase instead of it being an afterthought, right? Because I do understand that um, it does lengthen the product development cycle and we want to build fast, break fast. Right? So if you could share some concrete examples as well. Sure. Do you want, uh, which panelists do you want this um, to just to? Free for all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important question, so who would like to take a first shot of this? Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you, Ken, for bringing up the point on inclusion can be looked at in different angles. So you're right, right? Gender is one, and uh, uh, disabilities, people with disabilities and is another. I think so you bring up a really important point in terms of making sure that as we digitalize, we digitalize in a way that we are inclusive in every factor possible. Actually, you bring up a wonderful point, and um, a lot of our digital platforms are not necessarily accessible. I think that's the word we use in the tech world, right? Accessible from day one, right? Um, I've, had, I, I've been a person who's done digital marketing for many years. Actually, I started in 1999. And one of the ways I have seen some organizations handle it is, you know, typically when you go online, there is like an information security check, right? It is 
accessibility has almost got to be built in at that level, right? Like you would never go live if you didn't have an infosec checkbox. We almost need it at that level saying, are you also accessible? So I think that's one way of doing it because still there is that awareness, right? You might actually have to mandate it, mandate it has been my experience in this space, which is build it into processes, build it into checklists, because that's how large organizations usually manage um, requirements such as this. But thank you for bringing that up. I think it's important. That's a good answer. Very important question. I saw a hand from the lady. Uh, I'm from uh, Vietnamese Press uh, online newspaper in Vietnam. I have some uh, question for uh, Sophie. Sophie. Yes. Um, uh, what do you think about the e-commerce uh, market in Vietnam? E-commerce e e e market in Vietnam. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, big foreign e-commerce uh, companies are buying Vietnamese river. How? Uh, what about? Uh, what? What do you think? So sorry, I missed the second part. What is it? Big foreign company, e uh, commercial company, uh, buying Vietnamese rivers. Uh, what uh, What do you think about this? Foreign companies buying Vietnamese rivals. Yes, rivals. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Oh. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, online payment in Vietnam is still unpopular. In uh, this, can we, uh, sorry, can we limit the question into two? Because uh, we want to save some time for others. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so let me start. I, th I think uh, Vietnam e-commerce market have, have very exciting prospects. Um, and part of that is already a very strong real economy growing 6% plus a year as a base. Very strong talent pool that is attracting manufacturing from around the world anyway. So those are the two key conditions for good economy to begin with. And then you have add on top of that the digital economy, which is growing faster because on top of these strong fundamentals, you also have rising access to internet that Ms. Tran talked about. Um, the use of mobile, meaning that um, much further away, wherever you are, you can access to internet more easily. And that not just added the num number of consumers, but also the sellers, the SMEs, the micro entrepreneurs we talk about. So very, very exciting uh, prospect. Um, then talking about the theme of you know, outside investments um, buying local platforms, I think at the end of the day, one thing that, that we learn about the region, uh, ASEAN especially, is that it's huge potential, but it's not easy region to crack because each country is so different, so diverse. Do you know that actually Shopee, have, we operate in seven markets. We have seven versions for the apps. They are all different. Not just languages, the tabs are different, the, uh, the, uh, the, the products assortment are different, the recommendations are different, because that's reflecting the con local constraint, the pain points, the uh, customer culture, and what they prefer. And so my, my answer to you is that you may see this investment coming in, but the need to localize, localize and understand the local needs is so crucial. You can't just bring in capital and know-how that work from somewhere else and thinking you come to Vietnam and I'm going to win. You have to service, you have to help local firms, local sellers. And I think that is a good thing because it means that you have to put your customer, your sellers locally, SMEs first. So regardless of who comes in, where the capital comes from, if it serves, it helps the sellers, the youth, the SMEs. I think that's a good thing. Well, I think, uh, well, I don't think that it's a question for me, but it's a question for a business uh, when it comes to e-commerce. So I just want to share with you a little bit uh, my personal view and uh, have uh, give you some information uh, about e-commerce in Vietnam. I very much agree to what uh, you have already said, uh, Senator Tan have already said. Um, uh, what I mean here is, uh, overall, based on the latest data uh, provided by WTO, e-commerce in Vietnam in 2017 uh, was ranked 73rd out of 140 countries uh, in the world. So that means uh, the level of development and the scale uh, of e-commerce in Vietnam uh, is still below our potential. Uh, we still have more to offer uh, in terms of e-commerce, uh, uh, given the scale of, uh, given the growth of e-commerce in Vietnam, which is 30% a year, you know, it has a huge opportunity. And 
uh, in a wide range of FTAs that we already signed, there's one critical section on e-commerce development and also institutional and regulatory reform in response to the e-commerce development. And we have already done that in the FTAs that we already signed and in the future agreements that we will sign soon. So there are huge opportunities for investment here and development of e-commerce. And we already have 90 90 percent, uh, you know, uh, internet penetration in Vietnam. So it's also very enabling uh, to e-commerce, and we also improve the regulatory framework for e-commerce. Uh, and of course, uh, in order for e-commerce to develop, we need to have e-payment. Uh, so we will facilitate e-payment by increasing uh, the use of bank services. Uh, to facilitate the development of e-commerce. So we are taking steps uh, towards sustainability, slow but steady. Um, I already said by 2020 we expect e-commerce to be worth around uh, 10 billion US dollars or 5% of the uh, volumes in Vietnam. Uh, with the growing integration in Vietnam, uh, businesses uh, have a lot of opportunities to grow and develop here. The you know, international companies can come here and tap into the e-commerce uh, potential in Vietnam. I think we're slowly running out of time. And uh, for one hour, we share so many insights from our panelists and, uh, on, on regulation and policy making on the uh, role of the private sector and also on talent and, and changing the mindset. We also have wonderful insights from the audience on uh, having the inclusiveness as part of the design instead of the afterthought. So uh, before we close this session, um, we convene at um, uh, World Economic Forum on ASEAN every year. What, it's a very fast changing market and I'm sure a lot of things will happen between now and we meet each other again next year. So what will be the thing you think that will bring the most significant change from now to uh, next year in terms of digitalization in this market. Let's start from Santi, probably from this <laughs> <laughs> anti-clockwise. Right. Well, I, I have been in um, industry doing a lot of forecasting before, but I want to do something different <laughs> now. I want to talk about where I want to see, what I want to see, what we want to work towards rather than forecasting the future necessarily. So I think for us, really want to see e-commerce bringing a more inclusive economy. Um, and I think we already talked about that, about uh, the element of education, bringing the offline people to online. Um, I think there, there's huge scope more to be done. Uh, we have the Chop University, uh, the size is already quite big. Uh, one of the biggest market right now um, in terms of that is in Indonesia, where we're 50,000 entrepreneurs. We also have pretty big force in Vietnam as well. Um, interesting thing about that is that a lot of transactions that happen are happening actually outside the capital city, mm -hmm. it's in the rural area. And um, um, a lot of the entrepreneurs we help are actually female. Um, we have a number in Indonesia, it's actually around more than two thirds are female. Mm -hmm. So that actually bringing a lot of sometimes uh, women that have to step out of labor force, maybe have to having children, mm -hmm. now they can have an extra income from this process. So I think there's a lot of elements of inclusiveness that we can do much more as a platform player, not just us. And that's what I want to see in the future, more inclusive economy coming from e-commerce. More inclusiveness. Yes, Marty? Um, again, I think um, I wouldn't dare forecast anything in this world, right? I'm an IT professional. I know not to do that. But again, what would I like to see, right? I think I would like to see a step change in terms of um, the access that people have. When I say access, of course, there's internet access, access to financial services, and as you educated us today, access to logistic services, right? So there's access. I would like to see a step change, and actually, there's already a lot in ASEAN, but a lot more in terms of opportunity. So having these platforms which bridge the demand and the supply, having these platforms which reduce the number of intermediaries you need for cross-border trade, so around opportunity, right? And the third piece, something I have a lot of passion for, is knowledge and know-how. Right, and in a general increase in the average understanding and um, applied practical understanding of how digital works as a consumer, so knowing your do's and don'ts, what not to do, right, but also for small and medium enterprises to be able to take advantage of the opportunities the platforms provide. So access, platform, and know-how. Access, opportunity, and know-how. Know yes, and Toby, 
I can't put into Forecast or wishes? Yeah, for the, for the next year. <laughs> I, I, evolution more than revolution, I think, would be my keyword. One one line I want to share with you: we have a, a, a phrase that we use within Shipper Freight. We say trade follows the path of least resistance. Yeah. So as a, as, a, as a country, as a, as a company, you make it the, the easier you make it to do business in your country. You can attract more capital, <coughs> more talent, more companies. Um, there can be some soft elements to that, some hard elements to that, and I think that 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 would you know that's what we'd like to see. So the, some of these barriers that are there in payment, security, infrastructure, um, knowledge, awareness, understanding. I could go on. You know, trade follows the path of least resistance, and if you can help facilitate some of that, you can uh, help boost ASEAN and, and in particular the SMEs. Remove of barriers, basically. Remove, keep keep removing barriers because they're coming down, but they they still exist. That's why we keep the minister the last two coming to <laughs> solve all our problems. That's, that's great. I, I agree with everything that my co-speaker said. So what I want to add here is to say that um, I, I think what I forecast for next year is that um, we'll be here talking maybe for similar issues, similar challenges, but hopefully they'll have progressed already into the next level. Simple and Digital is here to stay and there's a lot to be done, but we need to have collaboration. Um, and I think that uh, dialogue and collaboration has, has to start. The other, uh, the other piece that I, I, I hope and, and wish can happen in the next 12 months until we come back here is to see a lot more pilots and new types of technologies and innovation being tried out, what we call micro battles, things where um, companies can try new innovations, whether it's in e-payments, whether it's in transactions, whether it's in e-commerce, or even you know, entering a new market and lowering the logistics barriers. And on this one, I'd like to uh, suggest to our audience to do their own little experiment for the next 12 months, to go and take out some cash and see how long can they last with that cash. Is it one month? Is it 45 days? Is it 50 days? The longer the days, the more digitalized your economy is becoming. So that's, that's a nice little trick and test to do on Monday morning. Or anyone who Monday wants. morning, I'll be in China, and I know the answer is at least one month. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Minister, you have the last word. Go ahead. Well... It seems that uh, I'm not in the right position to uh, make assessment or get any uh, observations. But, uh, you know, I, I'm the only one that represents the public sector, so I take on board what you shared today uh, from business perspectives uh, so that we could uh, translate them into uh, the policy decisions uh, across governments. I do not mean to discriminate uh, between ASEAN or outside of ASEAN region. In ASEAN, you know, we see it as one single family. We need to be strong and we need to be an important partner in this region and in the world. Uh, uh, I very much agree to what you said earlier, but I also like to draw your attention to Vietnam's contribution to web uh, on ASEAN. Uh, five critical connections that are seen as initiatives by the government of Vietnam. So it also includes uh, connectivity in digital infrastructure, institutional reform, and also joint efforts in, studying, in setting standards, common standards, so that we can ensure uh, interoperability uh, and compatibility uh, for the development of e-commerce uh, and also the joint initiative uh, to develop human resources uh, ready for uh, digitalization uh, across the board uh, in ASEAN uh, so that we have the quality um, human resources for digitalization and these are important initiatives of the government of Vietnam, and I hope that it will uh, actively respond to these initiatives, uh, from both from the public sector and the private sector, so that we can translate them into concrete actions, into the development of e-commerce uh, for prosperity of ASEAN and each and every single country. Um, I'm sure you will all want to join me in uh, give a full round of applause and thank all of my panelists for sharing with us the insights today. And that will end the Taishu debate tonight.